Hi, this is Larissa Co. We are going to be looking at some art movements today. The first one is Baroque art. This took place from 1600 to 1750 in Europe. In this time period, the Protestant Reformation was drawing a lot of people away from the Catholic Church, but we had this, uh, this revival of Catholic art and there was a lot of really cool art going on at the time that was an attempt to draw people back into the Catholic Church. There are lots of religious subjects and themes, and it's known for its grandeur, movement, tension, emotion, and ornamentation. You can see in this picture over here the movement and tension in this picture, which is a depiction of Teresa of Avila, who is a Catholic nun. And then the ornamentation up here behind the statue and the gold shining down and the, and the marble add to the majesty of the whole piece. One famous Baroque artist is named Diego Velázquez. He was a Spanish painter and his most famous painting is this one on the left. We see Margaret Teresa in the middle with her entourage. You see how the people are creating a circle around her. But in the background, you can see Diego Velázquez himself. He put himself in the painting. In the painting, he's painting a painting. Here's the canvas to the left of the picture, the painting. And then in the background, you see a mirror. Some people believe that this mirror reflects what Diego Velázquez is painting in this huge canvas. Other people say that this is meant to reflect the viewer of the painting. So it's kind of a breaking the the fourth wall in painting and that's one really revolutionary revolutionary thing about him he was a court artist for king philip the fourth and was very influential a lot of the times artists uh, were tied to the catholic church or tied to royalty and so these are some of the themes that we see a lot in baroque art next up is neoclassicism this took place from 1750 to 1850 the big shift from Baroque to neoclassical art happened partly because Pompeii had just been discovered. People were really interested in the past, and we see them looking back to ancient Greek and Roman stories, characters, and styles. So instead of depicting Christ and nuns and prophets, we see them suddenly sculpting Cupid and Psyche over here, ancient, uh, ancient Greek or Roman gods. And we also see a huge theme of patriotism. So in this one we have Napoleon Bonaparte who is looking grand. And then in this one, uh, The Oath of Herati by Jacques-Louis David, it's based on a Roman legend of three brothers who had to go and fight their cousins to the death over a dispute. Uh, in addition to the difficulty that that would bring, the brothers and cousins were engaged or married to each other's uh, to each other's sisters. So we see over here, understandably, the women and children are extremely distraught, but the three men who are about to fight to the death just look stoic and unemotional. This is a really common theme in ancient Greek and Roman art, and now it's coming back in neoclassical or new classical art. Another thing that we notice is the use of the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. In all of the paintings that we have here, we see a lot of the red, yellow, and blue. It kind of gives a stability to paintings and it adds to the grandeur of a painting when you see all three of the primary colors being used next to each other. It creates kind of a, a balance and contrast at the same time. During this neoclassical period, we had an artist named Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, uh, and she was supporting her family through portrait paintings at the age of 15. She made her way up all the way to becoming Queen Marie Antoinette's uh, painter. We can see a painting of the queen here. She is the queen who was famously beheaded during the French Revolution. And we see some neoclassical elements. All of the portraits look very grand. They depict royalty or herself in the case of the, the, the self-portraits. 
we see a lot of the red, yellow, and blue, again, the primary colors, some really flowing, realistic looking fabric, and then the light and dark contrast that we see in the other paintings as well that adds drama. At the same time that neoclassicism was going on, romanticism was also happening. This time period was 1780 through 1850. This was both in Europe and in America. So it's important to understand that at this time, the Enlightenment was going on. The Enlightenment stands on the ideas that you can use logic and rational, rationalism in order to create a better world for people. It's very focused on thinking for yourself, uh, science, kind of figuring out a better way rather than looking back at the way things have always been done traditionally. And we also had the Industrial Revolution going on at the same time. So a lot was progressing, but we also had some poor working conditions and the negative side of that as well. The Romanticism was going against both the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment. Rather than putting logic above all else, Romanticism is all about emotion, whether it's passion, love, or grief. And rather than moving forward and thinking of new ideas, Romanticism is all about nostalgia and looking back at the good old days. You can see in these paintings, uh, and this one over here is also a poem, that there's a wide variety in the way that these, that these romantic pieces looked, but some things that they have in common are that it has an emotional quality, a lot of it is very mystical. We can see beautiful scenery, especially in the next artist that we're going to look at. And one interesting romantic idea, a shift that I think still affects us today, is this idea that children are innocent and deserve to have happy, imaginative childhoods where they just get to be kids. Up until this point, kids were always regarded as tiny adults, and the goal was just to get them to grow up as fast as possible. But in this romantic movement, they really celebrated the idea of children being childish and innocent. Uh, you can see lots of themes of children in this art as well. This is our first American painter that we're going over. His name is Thomas Cole. He was an American immigrant from England and was a painter. He created landscapes showing the beauty of American nature. We also have that idea of childhood innocence. He created the Voyage of Life series in 1842. This one is called the Voyage of Life Childhood. We can see there's an angel and a little baby. This is when the now youth takes over the ship. Then we have manhood and some menacing clouds, but we still have the angel up here in the distance. And then old age, now the old man and the angel is leading him up towards heaven. Uh, this extended allegory is very romantic. This is one of his famous paintings as well called the Titan's Goblet. Not only do we have this village down here, but we have the goblet and then up here we can also see people. There's boats in this as well, and these people are kind of unaware of the rest of the world, just living their life on top of the goblet. So through his art, Thomas Cole was kind of like, okay, you and Europe have your, have your old castles and ancient history of victory, but in America, look at what we've got. We have this beautiful, amazing scenery. At the same time, we have the painter Francisco Goya, who is a Spanish painter. His artwork isn't exactly romantic, although it does have the dramatic and emotional tone. You can definitely see the emotion in his paintings, but the subject matter and kind of the idea of it is a little, it, it's unique to him. But he was appointed to be a court painter to Charles IV in 1789. After he saw the destruction of the war, his art images were gleaned from his imagination and dreams. Um, so we kind of see his nightmares coming out in his artwork. The next art movement we have is called Realism, which is 1848 to 1900. Features of realist and naturalist art, and it's known as both, are uh, the subject matter is everyday people doing everyday activities. 
and you'll see that the shift in color is pretty dramatic as well. If we go all the way back to uh, the neoclassicism, we have the bright, intense colors, and through romanticism, we still have that. But now once we're at realism, you can see that things are getting more dull and gray. The emotions are a lot less intense. It's more like people, how you would actually see them if you're going out and about. And rather than portraying mythological characters or royalty or religious figures, uh, kind of for the first time, we're seeing just a lot of everyday people in middle and lower class. This was used to ex expose some social injustices as well and kind of show problems that are going on out in the world. Uh, this is an artist that I really like from the period. His name is Jules Bret Breton, uh, and he was a realist artist in the 19th century in France. He was traditionally trained, uh, but then he put his skills to painting a lot of French uh, peasants instead of royalty like it used to be. But the three main artists of the time, uh, or of the realist movement, are Henri Darmier, Gustave Courbet, and then right here, Jean-Francois Millet. These are the three that are most popular for the movement. Next up is the Impressionist Movement, which took place from 1865 to 1885. So, Impressionist art is significantly different than any other style of art. It has a strong focus on light and its, and its effects. So, rather than trying to paint things completely realistically, the goal of a lot of Impressionist artists was to capture a moment in time specifically looking at how light interacts on different surfaces. You can see a lot of expressive, lively brush strokes, and Impressionists were really famous for painting outside. Rather than setting up a studio indoors, the artist would take a small canvas, head out to the countryside or city or wherever they want to work, and then in one sitting complete an entire painting. A lot of them didn't have the same focus on making it look realistic as they used to, but instead wanted to capture the impression or an impression of what they see. This art was rejected from the powerful Paris Salon. It didn't follow the traditional uh, patterns of art, but the Impressionists moved forward and they set up their own art show and this became a really powerful movement. Claude Monet is our first uh, artist highlight from this period. You may recognize his water lilies. He has a lot of these. He painted a lot of paintings. Uh, he was one that liked to go out and capture things in one session outdoors on a, on a small canvas and he really was the founder of Impressionism. It was his painting, Impression, Sunrise, that led to the name of Impressionism in the first place. Edgar Degas did not consider himself an Impressionist uh, because he didn't go outside with a small canvas. He actually really studied his subjects and liked to work indoors. A lot of his paintings are of dancers. He really enjoyed the opera. But because the style looks so much like that of other Impressionists, he is grouped together with them. Post-Impressionism is 1885 to 1910. This is a painting called The Sower by Vincent van Gogh. Post-Impressionist art includes intense colors. Uh, the viewer's eyes are meant to mix the colors from afar. So it's taking some of the ideas similar to that of Impressionism in that the brush strokes are visible, everything isn't perfectly smooth and put together, but it's taking it in a slightly different direction. Rather than trying to capture the effects of light through these brush strokes, they were trying for other effects. They wanted it to be more of an interactive experience where from far away 
you can see what the painting is meant to be, but close up, it may not even look like a painting. You may just see blobs or dots, a bunch of color that doesn't look the same as it does from far away. Post-Impressionism uses a lot of symbolism as well. And again, we're back to expression of feelings and a lot of thick paint on the canvas, which again was started in the Impressionist movement. Um, it's important to note that these artists did not believe that they were part of the post-impressionist movement because at the time it didn't exist. This group of painters was just grouped together in retrospect for the sake of looking at art history movements. George Seurat was a famous post-impressionist artist and he is really popular for his new painting technique called pointillism. Chromuluminarism is a similar technique and both of them require the viewer to mix the colors which are placed in patches or dots near each other. This is his most famous painting. It was created by pointillism. If you were to zoom in, you would see a lot of dots. You can see the dots even better in this uh, La Chana, La Chahou, <laughs> in this painting. And then in these two, we can see the style of using patches or brush strokes rather than dots to place colors near each other. It's pretty cool to see just how far art had come uh, from the very beginning of Baroque art and just how much, uh, by this point, just how much artists had broken from tradition and started trying different things. Uh, 